Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Soup Podcast. I'm Anthony J.Q. Nash, doing my best Bo Oliver impression if Bo Oliver were sick. I'm joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to record another episode of the Nerd Soup Podcast. Uh, we've got some important news to talk about. We've got some big strikes going on in the world of Hollywood, so this podcast may be over soon if no new content is being produced. We've also got early reviews for Barbie and Oppenheimer. Both have opened to positive reviews, as you can see from the title. And uh, yeah, we'll also be talking other Hollywood stuff as it pertains to the strike. Of course, you guys can listen to this episode here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We're actually recording this remotely today, so... Audio might sound a little different, but, you know, show must go on, sometimes. Aaron, how's it going, man? It's good, man. Um, yeah, show must go on, unless one of us is busy, or it's in Europe, or just not feeling it. That's our mission statement, it's right there. <laughs> whenever, whenever we feel like it. It's right there on the wall. Yeah. Um, no, I'm doing good, man. Just excited. Big week. Big week of movies. Movies are back, and, and they're not again. That, that's funny, at, a, at the same time. Movies are supposed to be back, but all the strikes going on, kind of putting a damper on things. But I don't know, it's a big weekend. One of the more uh, exciting weekends, I think, in a while, going to, uh, in terms of like going to see new releases coming out. I think around maybe, what was that two years ago, Dune came out? I was had this feeling, but as it gets closer to Friday, man, I'm just, I'm ready to go. And especially with all these reviews coming out, it's always good to have just something to look forward to at the old cinema. You know? Yeah, and that is our first topic, is the early reviews so far for Barbie and Oppenheimer. So on Rotten Tomatoes, Barbie is at 89% with 149 reviews in, and on Metacritic, it's at 81 based on 50 reviews. Oppenheimer's a bit higher right now on Rotten Tomatoes. It's at 94% with 112 reviews in, and on Metacritic, it's at 90 Damn. with 47 reviews. You almost got a So that Metacritic score is... Go ahead. No, you yeah, almost got to think if I'm someone sitting at home listening to this, which if I can only see one, you know, I'll be see Oppenheimer. And that has nothing to do with our impending bet and box office numbers, you know, as I would never let that sway my decision, my opinion of what I'm saying. But I, I'm thinking a lot of people are going to see that and be like, yeah, Oppenheimer and it's probably going to win the box office battle now. That sucks for you. Yeah, it's commendable that you thought so highly of Nolan's uh, just appeal at the box office, regardless <laughs> of the subject matter. But uh, uh, I, what I think Oppenheimer has going for it is that it was only a $100 million budget, which I, I thought it would be higher. So it's got a chance to, you know, make a decent profit. Yeah, especially with the uh, IMAX. I think that it's going to have legs. Yeah, I think it's going to have longer legs. I think the IMAX numbers are going to definitely boost that. It's going to be interesting. I think Barbie's going to come out the gate hot. But I mean, yeah, we've been looking forward to this day since it got announced that uh, these movies were going to release at the same time. And you know, we speculated that it might shift, so it might shift, but you have that kind of uh, overlaying aspect of the whole Warner Brothers versus Nolan thing added to it, too. So um, maybe a little pettiness involved, but I mean, it's great. And just to have these movies both come out, I mean, I was hoping anytime I'm excited for a movie, anything over 80, you know, I'm kind of happy with um, because... You know, it's it's definitely tough to get those movies that everybody really vibes with. But if it's above 80 and you're looking forward to it, then I think that's a pretty good sign. The fact that both of these movies are around the 90s, I mean, that's just better than what anyone could expect. And you have two of the better filmmakers working today, releasing on the same day. You see all, all the memes going around. It's going to be a pretty big weekend and a couple of weeks going forward. And I hope that, yeah, I think we'll enjoy them both but yeah i just hope everyone gets out there and enjoys them I i'm ready for the memes to stop though you know they were fun and you know i'm a fun, i knew you were gonna complain guy. about that i like to have fun you know making memes and making jokes but like if i see the same four tickets for a barbie movie meme again i'm gonna fucking build, build the atomic bomb. well it's funny that you say that because with your tweets you're always going back to the well like you hop on threads and immediately it's the Beatles are overrated. Yeah. Something with Lord like, of the Rings. I was listening to ABBA, you know, and I was just a little, little, had a couple of white claws on me. So yeah, I threw off that take and with Lord of the Rings, I just rewatch well, you... them and then, <laughs> you know, I just have new, I have new thoughts every time I watch them. Yeah. New thoughts. You're just upset that you haven't thought of a clever Barbie. Oh, I've thought of meme. many, but I'm not jumping off on that bandwagon. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, Turn invisible Frodo when nobody's Cap, looking. Sam carrying Frodo to 
to Mordor into the the fires. Um, two tickets for Oppenheimer, please. Two tickets again. Uh, yeah. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, I mean, based on the reports, it looks like a lot of people have bought tickets for both, which is fun. I I've seen some reluctance still from people when it comes to Barbie. Uh, that think that it's just going to be a chick flick, and I keep trying to tell people that was little Manny. He doesn't want to go see Barbie on the same day. But uh, yeah, I think Barbie. You know, yeah, it's just Barbie. Uh, I'm surprised to see how high it goes at the box office. I think it's got a lot of potential, and just based on the early uh, reviews, it, both movies have been called masterpieces by certain critics. Uh, it looks like Oppenheimer just a, a bit more favorable when it comes, and that's interesting with Nolan too because a movie like Tenet wasn't overwhelmingly critically acclaimed. You know, people were more split, and same thing with Interstellar. Even though Interstellar, over the years, I think more people have lo- uh, no, learned I mean, to love it. No, I mean, this might be its highest rated on tomatoes, so, uh, besides maybe The Dark Knight. When it's all said and done. Yeah, it's definitely the highest since Dunkirk, and it may be overall the highest since The Dark Knight. I just rewatched Dunkirk. That's such a good movie, man. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially for us, like I'm, I've been like looking forward to Friday for a while, just to go out, especially seeing it in seventy millimeter, I- seventy millimeter IMAX, and the more you hear about just what he's able to do on screen it just makes me all that more excited to see it in that format and then i did hear though that you know barbie is the better first movie because you're gonna be thinking about oppenheimer for the rest of the day then you're just gonna be watching barbie back of your mind you're thinking about that bomb yeah i think that makes sense it feels like oppenheimer is just gonna be such a draining experience uh i actually yeah, um, i think once like go ahead no, I was just gonna say, like once like Margot Robbie and like Dua Lipa hop on the screen, I think I'm Tillian Murphy's gonna have to take a back seat for a few hours. Yeah, it may be lingering, but I think it, it Barbie seems like a movie that's gonna be easy to get lost in just because of how fun it is and how weird everybody is saying that it is. And and that's what I keep trying to tell people. I'm like, yo, Greta Gerwig is a legit filmmaker. Where she's on where she said it in interviews that she wants to become like a Christopher Nolan, where she can exist in both worlds, where she makes movies for her, makes big studio movies that are also for her. That's why Nolan has struck the the perfect balance when it comes to that. Uh, I keep telling people, I'm like, yo, this is going to be, it's not going to be your typical chick flick, you know, it's just not for the girlies. It's it's going to be for everybody. Yeah, it's, I mean, right, when you're talking about Greta Gerwig too, I think that's what's something a lot of uh, maybe casual film goers don't really know or have no uh, knowledge of the film she's made or how good she is as a director. I mean, going back to like Little Woman, that was one of my favorite movies that year. And I think even with Lady Bird, uh, I think I like Little Woman a little bit more than Lady Bird, but um, just a critical acclaim and everyone seems to have loved that movie as well. So like, yeah, she's definitely a legit director. doesn't have the name name recognition as Nolan, but... Um, yeah, it's just going to be, like you said, something that's unique and different within this like established, uh, IP that is Barbie. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are or what you'd like to play with growing up. Like Barbies were just like a thing. It was like, if you had a little sister or went to your friend's house, like, yeah, the Barbies were out. And sometimes you would, yeah, you'd pick up a Barbie. You'd make sure no one else was looking, but you would play with that when you were a little kid. And it, it usually, uh, like you said, the uh, notion of that can be a little goofy and everything. But with a filmmaker like her, the cast they have coming into it, like I just expect it to be something different and very smart way to approach this type of story. Not some cheesy kids movie that's made just to make money because they have the name Barbie attached to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, it definitely could have been that movie if it was handled by a lesser director. And, you know, just hearing some of the pitches that people were making for Barbie movies over the years is just, I'm so thankful that it is Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach teaming up, being the Hollywood power couple that they are. And Barbie is so iconic, and that's why it's the Trojan horse method of making a movie, where you can bring in people who are saying, oh, finally, they made a Barbie movie. I know Barbie, that that should be fun. Dress in pink and, and have a good time, and the song with Nicki Minaj and Ice Spice. And then they're going to sit down and be treated to something that's more meta, a bit more smart, more clever, has something to say about, you know, the legacy of this toy and the legacy of iconography and how it can be exploited or, 
you know, the the existentialism that's also present in the trailer. So I think that yeah, it's going to be a more layered movie than people are expecting. And I think for some people it will throw them off and for others, maybe it, you know, they feel more invited to other types of films that are, that are like that. Yeah. I'm thinking of like, if there was a hot wheels movie, which there probably has been, or like the GI Joe movies, like yeah. going into those, like you expected like, Oh yeah, like a childhood toy, but it's going to be just a shitty movie and just using the name recognition as a way to get people in the seats. And uh, this is the complete opposite of that. It could work to a certain extent uh, when it comes to people, like I said, not really familiar with Greta Gerwig. But I mean, even when it comes to the cast, like I think having Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, who's very particular over his roles. I mean, I think he might be loosening it up, loosening up a little bit lately, especially with the gray man. But historically, he's just picked great movies and um, good roles. So I think seeing the people that she was able to bring in to lead this movie i think that's also just a great sign and yeah from everything i've read so far for both movies it just seems like it's kind of living up to the hype that we were hoping for when these movies were first announced yeah i have a feeling i'm going to enjoy both movies a lot i I mean over the last few weeks or so since i started diving into the oppenheimer biography i've been so excited for it just to see all of it come to light because it's really not all about the building of the bomb but it's just like how that set off the next five to six decades of the world we live in in terms of the cold war and the the nuclear arms race and the politics is what i'm really excited about and people are saying that robert downey jr's performance is going to warrant a lot of award consideration and i you know i i hate when people say this but because i think it's it should be considered a talent to be able to play yourself so well on screen but they're like oh this is Robert Downey Jr. showing that he could play other characters besides himself as Tony Stark, which I'm sure he does. And that's why I think he's such an incredible actor, because he can do both. Where he can lose himself in a role, or he's just really good at being himself. And And then the same thing with Barbie, where it's uh, Ryan Gosling's getting a lot of love. That's what I'm excited about, because, like, the Downey stuff is like, well, you're just thinking of Iron Man. Like, he's done many other things before that that can show you or proof that he's just not good at Iron Man. He's just a good actor. But the Gosling, like I, I had no doubts that like he would be great in this role, but in you know, Oscar buzz for something like this, when it seems like he's kind of just a goofy side character, or not a side character, but a supporting character to Barbie, um, that leads me to believe that there's a lot more going on with like a Ken character and get some depth and some uh, range from Gosling, which... I don't know if I was fully expecting, like, just based off the promotional materials, but that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah, I mean, his interviews have been so funny. I mean, a lot of his quotes have been going viral about his approach to the role. And he, he could poke fun at himself. And I think that's what's so awesome about Ryan Gosling. Like you said, he's been very picky with his roles. He's made a point to work with uh, a lot of the best directors. <laughs> the Gray Man money, I'm sure, was really sweet. So oh, oh, I'm hard to turn that down. a big proponent of getting your bag. But comedic acting, man, people, a lot of people are coming around on this. I think it is a bit more difficult than dramatic acting. And uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that he's that he's apparently this good in this role. And I'm glad that a, a role like this and a movie like this could warrant that type of award consideration because I think we need to be more open-minded as to what is the best acting, the best performances in movies because it doesn't always have to be the dramatic movie that's really sad and somber and has a lot of screaming and yelling. Sometimes it's like, yo, this is just as impressive to be really fun, really goofy, poke fun at yourself while crafting an authentic, real character. And it looks like that's what he's doing here. I mean, the one clip I saw of him in the hospital when he can't (laughs) wrap his head around the fact that a woman could be a doctor, his delivery was just so perfect. He's like, all right, well, can I speak to the doctor? (laughs) He just keeps repeating it. So uh, I'm excited. Both movies obviously stack casts. So I'm looking forward to seeing how both directors balanced all that star power. Yeah, I'm, with Oppenheimer, like you were saying, like doing some research, I've been doing like very selective readings because obviously it's a true story, but you know, I'm not, I don't know much about Oppenheimer. So I'm kind of like trying to save some stuff for the movie, but it's such an interesting little wormhole to get down, to get trapped in. Yeah, it is, dude. It's one of those things where like, if I was watching this at home, like, you know, when you watch a movie at home, that's like based on a true story, but you just can't help yourself from like Googling during it. Maybe pausing yeah, or looking it yeah. up. 
I was doing that with uh, what I watch. Oh, Raging Bull, because then I knew it was based on a true story. So I was like looking up his record, <laughs> and like I was just spoiling all the fights for me yeah. myself. Uh, so good thing we're in a theater here, because this is definitely the type of movie that I feel like once I get out of, once I get home, I'm just going to be on Wikipedia, just trying to learn as much as I can about this guy and this this time in history. Yeah, dude, it it really is such a fascinating time, especially when you like the physics of the early 20th century. Uh, there's so many rock stars that come in and out of his life. <laughs> you know, we see Einstein in the trailer, even though he wasn't part of the Manhattan Project. But a lot of those scientists who were, you know, physics then was like uh, it was like hip hop in the 90s where every new album was just something new. It was like every other year, some wacky scientist was coming up with a new groundbreaking theory. I saw and then it culminates in something so terrible. I saw a meme. It was like the post credits for Oppenheimer leaked, and it was John David Washington. It's like, hi, Oppenheimer. I'm the protagonist. We need to talk. <laughs> I mean, I would still love that, even though you put a damper on that, saying that it's not Warner Brothers. But uh, you could have just kept that to yourself and let me believe. But um, yeah, that's definitely not that happening. Comes out. It would be awesome though. It's like we need you, Oppie. <laughs> And Leo from Inception, like uh, I still, I'm just confused about my own movie. Somebody, please tell me if this is real or not. I love like connected worlds, like Tarantino. I was watching um, the first time I I've seen Hateful Eight, but I, I did the uh, the mini series on Netflix for the first time. Um, and what's his name? Roth's character. He says his name is Hecox, and I'm like, wait. You think is he related to Arch, Archie Hecox from the Fast Bender from Glorious Bastards? And he is. Oh yeah, he does that shit all the time. Yeah, that's really fun. I'm, I'm such the uh, like people won't watch a three hour movie, but will watch a whole season of Netflix. I literally was gonna watch Hateful Eight, and then I'm like, ah, oh, it's too long. And I saw the limited series. I'm like, well, I'll just watch a couple episodes, and I can pick it up tomorrow because it was getting late. And I ended up just watching the whole thing. Yeah. That's uh, Marissa asking me if she could watch Lord of the Rings as a TV show. It does work very the way it's edited. It works very well as a little limited series. Uh, the Hateful Eight or uh, Lord Hateful of the Rings? Eight. It's good. I I don't really remember Hateful Eight that well, like in terms of like uh, what's what was added in and what was left out. So I can't really compare and contrast that way. But I mean, I remember liking it but i think i liked it a lot more watching it this way maybe it's just that i'm you know a little bit older or different perspective on it or maybe it does make that much of a difference but i really liked it yeah i love the hateful eight that's actually one of my favorite of his uh i just thought it was so epic for a movie that just takes place in one little cabin yeah i got um and samuel jackson arguably his best performance i mean very funny too Oh, he's so funny, dude. I mean, the ending, too, with him and Walton Goggins when they start bonding over, you know, no spoilers, yeah. but it's just so funny. Um, I need to start game planning planning for Oppenheimer because, like, I can't remember. I used to be so good at this, but I cannot remember the last time I watched a movie without going to the bathroom. And three hours is going to be tough, especially in that theater. It's such a pain in the ass to go leave and use the bathroom in the middle of a movie. I don't think I'm just... You know what's really helped me with that? I went on a two-hour drive where I had to pee from the very beginning, and I held it for the entire drive. And now I feel like I'm just unstoppable. Yeah. I'm not. Like I could just hold pee. I don't think I'm gonna drink, and it helps because we're going to an early showing. So I just I think I'm just gonna go dr- go into it dry. Well, especially that theater too. Going to the bathroom, it's so goddamn big. <laughs> it's like a trek to get to the bathroom. But I've gotten better at. But, uh, knowing what parts to leave at, like during Mission Impossible, I'm like, yeah, I can leave. I can, I can miss these, this two minutes. Oh yeah, no, I, I really had to go during Mission Impossible. I was like, uh, I, I timed it perfectly. It was right after uh, somebody kicked well, the bucket. I, I was like, yeah, these out. <laughs> I did say that I was a little bit confused during that movie, so maybe the time I left, like something like that, would have made me follow it a little better. Happen so. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe that happened with me too. But I saw a couple of people calling Oppenheimer Christopher Nolan's JFK, which is so funny because JFK, similar type where it's it's really long and uh, it's got a lot of different famous people in it, a lot of jumping around. And it, it did hit me like a few weeks ago. I was like, oh, this isn't going to be linear. This is going to like be spliced in with the uh, black and white scenes 
that are a bit in the future and then the actual Manhattan Project. So I don't know, man. I, I feel just my gut. I feel like it's going to be his best movie since The Dark Knight. So uh, I'm way I've become way more excited for Oppenheimer. And it's not a competition because I think Barbie's going to be great, too. But there's just something about Oppenheimer where I, I sense greatness over it's the horizon. And especially like uh, no, I'm saying it's the competition for me. Well, I mean, come on, you lost. I mean, you could. I, I, the numbers aren't in yet, but if Kornacki was doing the numbers here, he would call. Yeah, what are race. some swing states and box office numbers? I really need um, Louisiana to come up big for me here. Well, there was the report that in India they've bought five times more tickets for Oppenheimer than Barbie. Hell yeah! But we will see. I, I hope Oppenheimer does really well, but I, I think Barbie is going to win that. I feel like because that Barbie hype, the marketing too has been unbelievable. Oh, it's Ult, I think, has been great. Oppenheimer really, on its own, I don't think it has been strong, but the whole Barbenheimer thing, I, I think, elevated it to a point where, um, yeah. I'm not saying it wouldn't do well if it released separately, but I think it's kind of rid on the coattails of the Barbie hype train because it's just been so connected throughout. Well, I feel like Oppenheimer has also had way more traditional marketing. This is just, from my trip to Europe, I, I saw Oppenheimer posters everywhere oh, like yeah. every bus every subway station you you couldn't escape it and you saw some barbie stuff but it feels like the, a lot of the barbie promotion has existed on the internet and it is people have made this point it's sort of tough to have a fun marketing campaign with a movie like oppenheimer because it is a more serious subject I love and a subject that to this day inspires a lot of debate yeah sure of course but um i love the the meme of the Wappenheimer. That's a missed opportunity. <laughs> the Whopper song for Oppenheimer. All right, that is Oppenheimer. He would have loved the Junior Bacon Whopper. Well, Killian Murphy. I mean, just to, you know, last points on this subject before we move on. He was the best casting for this role because when you read about Oppenheimer, he was just such a nervous weirdo. And a uh, chain smoker. Apparently, he smoked so much that his fingertips became permanently black. And uh, and then people are saying like, oh, there's just like twenty percent of the movie is just close-ups of Killian Murphy's face with the moral torment written all over him, and uh, just from a lot of the still images you see of that guy, it's like, man, he's going through it. When you hear the stories about how he basically starved himself to play this role, going full method because apparently Oppenheimer was six foot one hundred and twenty pounds yeah, hopefully. by the end of the Manhattan Project. Hopefully not full method, but I appreciate the effort there. Um, I do hope that. He does get some maybe award recognition. Uh, everything I've seen so far has been leaning towards Robert Downey, but I hope he doesn't get lost in that whole thing. And for Nolan, too, as much of a name he is and how beloved he is critically and from general audiences, I mean, what movie has he made that has like really dominated like award season? Yeah, no, he never gets nominated. I think his only Best Director nomination is Dunkirk. So, yeah. And uh, like you said, no movie has really ever swept the Oscars. So this can be his... I think this is his yeah. chance. Yeah. I think he'll definitely get nominated for this. This has Best Picture written all over it, too. I mean, with all the star power, uh, he feels kind of due. Uh, I don't know. That is that is how the Academy works sometimes. It's like, well, Nolan's he's due for one. And uh, you know what? My relationship with Nolan, I don't know personally, but to his movies, it's like, a, it's not love-hate, it's like love. Yeah. Um, but I just, I, I appreciate how much of a fucking nerd he is. He really loves this shit and he gives it his all. Even if the movies, sometimes I don't love them like a movie like Tenet, where I just respect the effort so much. And I think a lot of times people, they take his sloppiness too personally where it's like, uh, uh <laughs> people really don't like Christopher Nolan. Like the people who don't like his movies really don't like them. And uh, I feel like he delivers sometimes for me in spectacular ways, like with Dunkirk. Loved Dunkirk. Didn't love Tenet. Uh, Not Tenet. Loved The Dark Knight. Tenet's a big respect. Didn't love Inception. Tenet's a big respect the game movie. Right. Yeah, it definitely is. And it's a movie that I've been wanting to revisit for so long, but I just haven't. Because it's, it's something you watch, at least for me. Didn't love it, but couldn't get it out of my mind. So maybe I'll go back and revisit that before, uh, before Oppie. Yeah, I did Dunkirk. I was thinking of doing maybe one of his older movies, but 
that it could be a good rewatch. I was gonna do Little Woman also, but uh, I feel like that's just such, Barbie's just such a different movie from everything else she did. <laughs> like I feel like you don't really need to dive deep into her filmography to get ready for Barbie. Maybe you do, but um, that's also just a, a draining emotional emotional draining movie. Yeah, yeah, and she. I think some of that definitely carry over because it, it, you know, all three movies starring a woman who's trying to figure herself out, you know, Barbie, you can't call it a coming of age, but it's definitely got shades of that where she realizes something's off. Something's not right. You could, here. I mean, in the sense of like her coming into like the real world and finding herself, I think you can definitely find a lot of similarities with your classic coming of age story, even though it is a, uh, an older I guess character, but yeah, it's just going to be a good, good, good weekend at the cinema, as I like to like to say. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Before we move on to the next topics in this podcast, I want to take a quick moment to shout out our sponsor for today's episode, and that would be ExpressVPN. You know what I find really stupid about all these streaming services? Let's just take Netflix for example. So, say you live in the states and you're watching a show, and you have your friend who lives over in Europe saying, "Hey, have you seen this show that I really like? It's really good. I think you should check it out." And then you go and look on your Netflix library and the show isn't there. Well, that happens for people living all over the world because Netflix is hiding thousands of shows and movies based on where you live, based on your location. Now, you could just cancel your subscription in protest or you could be smart about it and make sure you're getting your full money's worth by using ExpressVPN. What you might not know is that what's on Netflix in your country is completely different from what someone in the UK or South Korea has on theirs. But by using ExpressVPN, you can control which country you want Netflix to think you're in. ExpressVPN has over 90 countries to choose from, so every time you run out of stuff to watch, you could switch over to a new country and unlock new shows. And here's the best part, it's not just for Netflix. You can use ExpressVPN to unlock shows on all other streaming services because they're all kind of doing it. It's not just Netflix, but I figured I'd call them out since they're the biggest and baddest. <laughs> but there's a ton of great shows that you can watch, uh, specifically British comedies that are only available in the UK. So instead of being locked out of those shows, you can use ExpressVPN and get your laughs in. ExpressVPN is also super fast and works on your phone, laptop, and even smart TVs. So you can watch your shows on the big screen with zero buffering. So be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash nerdsoup. Don't forget to use our link so you can get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash nerdsoup. Visit expressvpn dot com slash nerdsoup to learn more. All right, well, let's move on to the next topic. We're talking about the SAG after a strike. So SAG after has launched its first strike against the film and TV companies in 43 years, starting last Thursday. Uh, the major issues of the strike are artificial inte uh, intelligence, streaming v revenue sharing, and increases in the money that, that these writers and actors earn to keep pace with inflation. So this is something that we kind of saw coming, and we obviously talked about the writer's strike uh, a few weeks ago when that started, or maybe it's been it's been a few months now, I think. Yeah, it's funny that, like, um, especially, like, an hour like circle or whatever you want to call it. Like people were wondering like if they are allowed to talk about movies and review movies and why was this not a con no one brought this up during the writer's strike. But once SAG joined in, um, it seemed to be brought up. But yeah, I mean, we could still talk about it. I think the biggest thing here is that um, I guess just wondering how long it's going to take and if these studios are going to try to resolve this issue i mean when you look at some of the things that are on the table here especially with the whole ai thing the one that really kind of blew me away in terms of like the studio is thinking that they can like get away with this and that it shouldn't be a cause for concern is like using ai to get someone's likeness and then use it forever without consent and without paying the person whose likeness it's based off of uh, to me, that's like kind of insane. No, one of the many issues. But oh no, that's like some that's like some really bleak shit, like uh, Blade Runner. But you know what's really stuck out to me, dude, is the whole uh, Hollywood's accounting being very sketchy. All these stories coming about about how Peter Jackson had to sue 
Uh, I guess that's Fox, right? That made the the Lord of the Rings movies. I don't remember. Whatever studio it was, he had to sue them because they were claiming that the Lord of the Rings trilogy didn't turn a profit. Like, can you imagine how many fucking writers, actors, directors have been screwed over? Because it's like, you know, we have to trust you, right? You're the ones keeping the books or you sue them, you know, or you know, if you think that's total bullshit. I mean, it's harder to get away with that when it's a franchise like the Lord of the Rings, which is obviously making tons of money at the box office. And you know, it's frustrating too. But, uh, I don't know if you saw the news about The Rock getting $50 million for that Amazon movie. Like, and you've talked about this well, that's for years, why... just like yeah. the overpaying of some of the bigger actors. Like, obviously, you know, I think it is deserved for some people who are, have an established name and definitely bring in people to see the box office. But some of the discrepancies in pay, I think it, it just would continue to become overwhelming. And I think there should be a, especially with the studios, I mean, there's no, I guess, checks and balances when it comes to their management of funds and you know you can argue that it's it's their money they can do what they want with it but time and time again we see these bloated budgets budgets due to you know the way they allocate their their resources and when those don't turn a profit the studio takes it out on the writers on the actors on you know everybody else involved and never really puts the blame on themselves it's like no one yeah totally like, they've created this model and then they complain Amazon, about no it. one made you give the rock 50 million dollars but when that movie comes out and does shit at the box office what are you what are you going to cut next right so um yeah i mean like you said with all these bloated budgets too dude it's all it's a bubble that has i guess popped now at this point it's just not sustainable residuals are a joke especially with streaming and that's another thing with netflix every time every time they release a netflix original all they can't help themselves but to brag about the record-breaking numbers of streams and views and this and that and like okay good you're making money now if why not give that to the people who made the project and worked on it all these years and put their time into it it's kind of I don't know, with streaming, it's made things, I guess, more difficult because when things in the past were in syndication, I guess there was an easier way to track and the way the contracts were written up, I guess, made it just a better position for a lot of these people to profit off of residuals. But streaming, it kind of seems like it's we buy a project or we choose what to put on our site and we pay for that and then that's it. No matter how well it does, no matter uh, what happens next, you know, we're clear of that now. We don't have to worry about anything like that. But we see time and time again, especially during COVID and things like that, just the resurgences of shows that are getting a second life and the people who made those shows, acted in them, written in them, aren't getting a share of that uh, increased viewership. And look at The Office when it came to Netflix and shows like Community who people were rewatching and they go re-viral and people are talking about these shows from 10 years ago. Suits is a big one. I can't go anywhere without seeing Suits. It's been trending top 10 on Netflix for the past, like, I don't know, however long. Uh, do you think the Suits people are getting any of the any of that bread? Probably not. Well, we probably know they aren't. Yeah, I think that uh, when it comes to streaming... That model is going to have to change. It's just going to have to become more expensive. And, you know, the fun's over. Because if they're not making enough money, when they sh it's like they're just burning money because these shows are so popular. You can monetize that. And it used to be, like you said, you put it in syndication. And that's why people would get residual checks for, you know, randomly $20,000 every month. Which isn't, you know... They're obviously millionaires in Hollywood, but that's pretty nice. You get to sit back and do nothing for 12 months out of the yeah. year. That adds up. But now that just doesn't Make exist. Me. So, I mean, it, I was going to say, Meghan Markle needs those suits residuals. Her podcast fell apart. What's she going to do? And it's also, you know, a lot of people say, why are people crying over millionaires fighting with billionaires? There's, there's a lot of working class people in Hollywood, dude, especially when it comes to those who are behind the scenes, the majority, writers especially. But there are plenty of actors who have to work all year around in order to sustain the majority their lifestyles. Of actors and writers aren't what we think of when we think of millionaire Hollywood actors. You know, for every 
The Rock, who's making $50 million a movie, there's probably hundreds of actors who are, like you said, working year-round trying to stay afloat while they're able to build their career and hopefully one day reach those heights. And most don't, so... Yeah, I'll just never understand this reluctance to support people I mean, against yeah, corporations. Like- Ron Perlman made that video and everyone's like, well, you're worth $8 million, Ron Perlman. Well, he, he wants more people to make and money. And that was sh- shockingly, shockingly low from what I thought Ron yeah, Perlman was Yeah, this guy's be been in major, major movies. And that, that's the other thing. This country, we're obsessed with this idea of you're worth what you work for. And it's like these people are saying, okay, look at the, the money that these projects are pulling in. That says that, you know, emotion aside, just pure statistics, I'm worth this much. It's like when somebody says Steph Curry is actually worth $200 million to the Golden State Warriors. That's what he should be paid. That's what he should be paid. I'm not, I, I'm not playing the fucking violin for <laughs> Steph Curry, but that's just a fucking fact. So I, I don't understand the hesitation yeah, to, uh, it, it's pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you know, work for everything you got. And then when people say, well, I'm working and not being compensated, and people are like, well, I'm not going to cry for you. It's just, <laughs> life's not fair, but like, it's about what's fair. UPS. Yeah, UPS, same thing. Related to like working people, like blue collar jobs, like what they're going through and with their strikes, it's all about being treated fairly and getting what you deserve. And especially when you look at the earnings of the CEOs of these major studios over the past five years, you look at those numbers and, you know, it's pretty astounding, like pretty astonishing. Um that like there definitely is resources available to fairly compensate people and i don't think any of the asks like none of the, none of these asks are like we deserve millions of dollars like it's very reasonable in the realm of possibility uh demands that i think you know some of them shouldn't even be like an issue as i saw some things about like lunch breaks and things like that like basic like workers rights that being withheld it's yeah it comes across everything like you said with sports before look at like the running backs in the nfl <laughs> that's a big thing P- uh, the people who touch the ball more than anybody else on the field besides the quarterback and yet they can't get any reasonable contracts yeah and i think what's the um, what totally destroys any argument these studios may have is this new report that sag has approved 39 indie projects to shoot during the strike so a lot of these studios aren't connected to major studios. So they're going to allow these actors and writers to work on these projects. And the only reason that they signed this waiver is because all of these smaller studios that aren't Disney, that aren't Warner Brothers, they agreed to the terms. So you're telling me A24 can agree to bump the salaries of these actors and writers, but Disney can't? Like, Bob Iger's going to go on national television and bitch and moan about how unreasonable they're being, but A24's like, sign me up? I mean, that just ends the debate right there. And the the cockiness of these studios, they're saying, oh, we're going to bleed them out until they start losing homes and losing apartments. We've got content for months. And then a week later, we've got no content. We don't know what we're going to do. I mean, just fucking go to the table, man, and make a goddamn deal. And go back to the old yeah, model. I mean... No one's to blame besides Disney for putting, what, $200 million into a Haunted Mansion movie that no one's going to see? <laughs> yeah, dude. Right. They, they make these movies, like Indiana Jones, for $400 million, and then they cry, well, people just don't watch movies anymore. They're not as profitable. Because you're making it that way. I mean, we've... But that, that's what gets so frustrating. We've seen over the years that audiences are, de- are not going out to the theaters. Or it's in decline. And they've done nothing to adapt. It's like uh, nobody's buying your cell phone anymore. So I'm going to manufacture a $500 million worth of more cell phones. That's just bad business. So they, they've Black ran Mary. their companies like fucking monkeys, like morons. And then they want to turn around and blame the creators while all of their CEO salaries continue to go up. And now there's reports that Bob Iger is looking to sell Disney. So you came out of retirement just for another big fat payday because you know he's going to get compensated in in the hundreds of millions if that company was sold so (laughs) it's just hard to like take the studio seriously at this point and it's and like you said some of the demands are like a five percent raise here more residuals uh, more openness as to how much money these projects are making it's not unreasonable 
They've, touched, yeah. they've lost sight like, of what has made Hollywood a, a thriving business over the last 100 years. I agree. I mean, what was it like? The She Hulk writer got like a $300 residual. And now it's come out that She Hulk budget was like north of $200 million. <laughs> $200 million <laughs> for She Hulk, dude. Like, nah, it just doesn't add up to me. And you give Villeneuve a hundred million dollars, and he makes the best looking movie you've ever seen in your life. Or Nolan. Yeah, or Nolan, or a horror movie that costs five dollars to make and it makes thirty million opening weekend. Like, you want to save Hollywood? Just make horror movies. But they they, they just don't learn their fucking lessons, dude. I mean, the fun's over. I, I I you can't blame the MCU, but it's a lot of them chasing that MCU money. And now that bubble has just totally burst. And it, Disney seems to be, you know, the, the biggest victim of that. And nobody's crying for Disney, but you look at some of these movies that they put out with the budgets that they have. And uh, it's just, like I said, the fun's over when it comes to that. It's time to readjust. You, know, you need to convince these actors and writers to, to come back to work because you can't do it without them. And uh, it, it's time to scale back. Yeah. Um going to be interesting to see when and how this all wraps up. I mean, looking forward to even this year with, um, you know, your typical, uh, I guess, like, like, you know, promoting movies. We talked about how well Barbie has done with its promotion, the way Tom Cruise has promoted Mission Impossible, not being, not having these actors with their junkets and with the press and these late night shows and everything else that kind of is involved with it. Even uh, critics, um, you know, we can obviously talk about these things and talk about movies, but, you know, I think SAG is saying something along the lines of promotion by studios paid promotion so them using your taglines and stuff like that um they're not going to get that they're not going to have the ability to use these tools to promote these movies and at a certain point as much as they think they can wait wait everyone out i think that's going to kind of catch up to them as well um you have the festivals coming up not being able to have your stars there to promote these movies and kind of begin your campaign towards uh, your national releases and award season. You're not going to have the ability to have the people who worked on this movie help promote it. And I don't know, it seems like it might not be resolved by then. So you wonder how they're going to adjust and on the fly and kind of figure out how they're going to promote these movies on their own. But that's even going to cost even more money for the studio. So hopefully for the sake of everybody, the sake of... The actors, writers, the people who just like to go to the movies, this just gets resolved in a timely manner in a way that's beneficial to everyone involved. But that's yeah, just and not it's, how the world works. It's going to hurt a lot of, you know, a lot of creators who work behind the scenes in Hollywood. A lot of these bigger productions stopping, like uh, Deadpool and uh, Gladiator 2. A lot of those people that are working on those movies, doing makeup, doing set design, holding boom mics, all those other jobs that make up the the names on the credits that you see rolling after every film they're going to be hurt by this but like you said the studios are going to be hurt as well because it's going to affect their ability to market these films because sag has told their actors no promotion no social media no interviews uh i don't know maybe i'm being an optimist but i feel like this is going to be resolved it's going to be one of those overnight things where studios are like let's just let's just get this done like we'll, we'll we'll give you what you want because it's not that ridiculous <laughs> what they're asking I for. What, like, I wonder what like the quote unquote deadline is because like usually when like the NFL PA or MLB PA goes on strike, um, you kind of have an idea of when you'll know because when the season starts, you know, when MLB was on strike, you kind of had the idea like, all right, like March before April, like something is going to either be resolved or it's just going to be what it is. Uh, I don't really know if there's like a, a date in mind or a time where it's like, we need to get this done by this date in order to make sure everything kind of runs smooth, smoothly or as smoothly as possible going forward. Yeah. I think that I recently read that since the strike has started and it's only been six days, there hasn't been any negotiations that the last negotiations were before the strike happened. Uh, where the studios essentially rejected all the major proposals and SAG decided to strike. Uh, and I also imagine that 
with like the NBA or other sports, there's so much that you have to prepare for when it comes to like the infrastructure. There's so many moving parts, the logistics of it all. You're making sure that you, you have the times booked at these certain arenas so that it doesn't conflict with concerts and other bullshit like that and, and travel schedules. It feels like Gladiator 2, you know, if the strike ended tomorrow, they'd be back filming next week, you know. Maybe not that quickly, but it seems like something where you could get the gang back together and, like, the infrastructure's all intact. Like, Ryan Reynolds isn't going to be busy when uh, the strike <laughs> ends. Because you know he ain't doing any of those independent movies. Or maybe he will. And that's uh, sort of the silver lining, is that there may be this sort of, uh, from, the Phoenix, uh, from the ashes arises the phoenix effect where you get all these bigger stars working in smaller movies and uh, there's a just a renaissance of independent films because that's been suffer something that's been suffering for a long time every year it seems like there's less and less independent films people for a long time had this idea that the bigger movies fund the smaller movies but that's not necessarily the case but uh well, you, you're seeing perfect. all these projects that are being greenlit so yeah i mean that in a perfect world uh was it like trickle down Movenomics. Um, yeah, right. People want to. That would be ideally, but it, it works both ways. When the, flash, when the Flash becomes one of the biggest busts of all time, that's they're not going to look at, well, maybe we should slow down on the superhero movies. We'll be like, oh, no, we'll just cut all these smaller projects. Right. Yeah, and if that's the only thing that these actors can do in the meantime, like I said, there may be just a, a, a renaissance, and it could be really fun for a little while start just going uh, over, overseas there. say that again they start going overseas yeah basically well the hockey guys <laughs> i mean that's played, actually played in europe because uh house of the dragons could continue filming because a lot of those actors are in the uh the european union or the uk union not the british ones though remember brexit well the actual european union yeah no they're not in it I still don't know what Brexit was. It's actually funny in Europe when you take the trains to the different countries, you don't need to show your passport, but for the UK you would because they're not in the EU anymore. Just have to yeah, fuck no. it up for everybody else. I know, I've been to Europe too. Okay, calm down. No, I kind of like it. It stamped. sucks that they don't st stamp your passport on the layover though. It'd be nice to just I know, I know. have that stamp. I wanted a stamp. Yeah, I wanted passport. a stamp too. I only right. got the Amsterdam stamp. Right here, actually. What stamp did I get? You you have your passport on you? It's literally, like, right next to my computer. Yeah, I got two... Two Switzerland's. Two different ones. Okay, no, one. you do. Yeah, you get the Switzerland. You don't. You didn't get the Greece stamp. No. That'd probably be a cool stamp. Yeah, that's why I'm... You know, I wanted the France stamp, but whatever. But uh, some of these movies that were announced sound pretty good. There's uh, Mother Mary from David Lowry, director of uh, Peter's Dragon and The Green Knight. Starring Anne Hathaway and Michaela Cole. Uh, there's also a movie called Death of a Unicorn, starring Paul Rudd and Jenna Ortega, about a father and daughter who accidentally run over a unicorn. That happened to me once. And uh, there's a couple of the, the rivals of Amzia King, starring Matthew McConaughey, Flight Risk, starring Mark Wahlberg, directed by Mel Gibson, Dust Bunny, starring Mads Mikkelsen and Sigourney Weaver, Bride Hard with Rebel Wilson, and The Chosen, which is a TV series about the life of Jesus. Oh, wow. So these are some of the bigger projects that were announced. The bigger, smaller projects. I can't wait. I'm going to draft this tweet right now. When The Chosen comes out, book was better. Yeah, that's a good one. I actually downloaded the Holy Bible on Audible. I'm about to bump it. <laughs> who, uh, who narrates that? Morgan Freeman? Uh, I think the one I have, it's Danny DeVito. <laughs> 80 hours of DeVito just spitting scripture. I wish I had some bars. Oh, uh, no, it's just like some woman. I wish I had some bars from the Bible memorized so I can do it in a Danny DeVito voice, but... Well, the last story we have on the outline is about the Masters of the Universe movie, which is was going to be a live-action adaptation of the Mattel toys, like He-Man and others. Uh, it was supposed to come out on Netflix, but now it's officially dead, after Netflix has already spent $30 million on development costs. So Mattel is apparently shopping the film to other studios. Should we buy it? Uh, I mean, depending on what it's going for, maybe we could pull our money. Yeah. Juice scab. I know Nash just got a good job, so. 
if Netflix came off to you, it was like, hey, we need some ideas from some some shows. You scabbing? What do you mean scabbing? Breaking the strike. Kind of like, uh, oh no, I would never cross a picket line. Are you crazy? Well, that's to the point too, where people are like, oh, critics should stop talking about these movies. Uh, I think SAG has specifically said not to do that. No, but- where people are saying oh, we're going to boycott these streaming services and we're going to boycott movies. They're like, no, don't do that because that's going to hurt our argument. No, like especially like I think it's just paid promotion. They don't want us to want people to do, but I mean, right. Even talk. Well, I also have no problem going back and reviewing old movies for the rest of the strike. So. Yeah, but, like, I don't know. That's kind of a tricky situation, especially, like, with a lot of critics, freelance critics, probably aren't, like, have their own struggles, and, you know, now just to be like, you can't make money off of what you do because we're striking. That seems, that seems a little unfair. So, like, if we review a movie, we can't put an ad on it type of thing? No, we can't just do today's podcast, which we don't because no one likes us. This podcast is sponsored by it's... Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah. No, we have no problem with that. We can't even get it to a fucking early screening. Yeah. We've been striking for fucking years. Yeah, I just, I just don't think we can, like, or we're not supposed to promote, like, upcoming movies on behalf of studios. Because that's probably what they're going to try to do now that they can't use their actors. They'll probably use, try to go elsewhere for promotion. And I think that's what they don't want critics and. I guess, content creators around the industry to do. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is something that we're definitely going to continue to talk about as the strike uh, continues, but I think that it goes without saying that. (laughs) I don't know how much influence we have these days, but we, we of course, support uh, the actors and the writers who are striking. And uh, I've said this many times before, unions aren't perfect, but they are fucking necessary. Because these motherfuckers will hang you out to dry. You give them an inch, they take a mile. And uh, I, I was just so angry hearing some of the comments, especially from a guy like Bob Iger. Like, some of these people have some fucking nerve. And, and uh, the anonymous guy who was like, we're going to starve these people out. It's so, you're allowed to use threatening language when you're a billionaire, when you're a corporation. Because that's, that's what that is. That's a fucking threat. We're, we're trying to destroy your lives. Can you imagine if, like, what if I said that to somebody? Just like out on the street. Dude, I mean, like, <laughs> like that's inflammatory fucking language. It's like no one likes you. No one like roots for the the CEO of the, the company. Well, some bootlickers. Yeah, some well, do. yeah. I, I just I'll never see get the same it. Thing in sports when players hold out for money, but um, yeah. I mean, like at least, like not at least, but like I appreciate that whoever said that was kind of like that transparent because it just shows people what the situation is and how kind of ruthless and all they care about is money. A lot of these corporations and CEOs are like, that's just, how, that's just what, the, how they deal. That's how they uh, navigate. And yeah, that's a good point. Cause it's such a stupid fucking thing to say I need to. at the beginning of a strike. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not related, but kind of related. Um, it was funny. Like speaking of just billionaires and, people's perceptions of them um it was so funny to see when thread started everyone just fucking sucking off mark zuckerberg I was like yeah we didn't yeah. we hate this guy like two months ago <laughs> it's so funny how that shit like, he always just flips. became the man for like um like that like yeah, a few days did. and i'm like well, were we still angry about him like data mining all of us and and kind of deceiving all of us. It's like, nah, he 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 made threads. We can hate both of them. Yeah, we can hate threads. Elon ends Zuckerberg. You don't have to make a pick. And threads kind of sucks. Yeah, it kind of fell off quickly. But I'll have it in the back burner. All right, let's take some fan questions before we end this podcast. That's for the fan to decide. Yay! People, you call up to the show. You better be ready. That's what you're supposed to do. Sitting there arguing and trying to spell your name and all of this other stuff. It's not just show. It's my show. I'm giving you the, the opportunity to speak your mind. Don't call up here unless you got something to say. Uh, I felt like you were going to say something before I cut yeah, you yeah, off. I there. forgot. I'm on Twitter now looking at oh, that's good. Barbie and Oppenheimer memes. Uh, this question here from Homero underscore 78. If Hollywood shuts down, does that mean you guys need to find regular jobs? I don't think it's going to shut down. 
Yeah, no, like I said, I will just, uh, I'll review anime, or we'll review anime, or we'll just Ooh. review old movies. Akira Kurosawa revisited anime, for the win. Anime, uh, recommendation. Um, fuck. I, I just forgot its name. It's just a new one, I saw it on Netflix, I just saw it the other day. Um, why can't I think of it? It's a, it's a zombie anime on Netflix that I started. Only two episodes in, in first season. Really good so far. I like it, at least. You ever hear of it? <laughs> no, I It's about, like, this guy, he's, like, he's stuck in pretty, pretty, uh, I guess, uh, relatable to what we're talking about. He's stuck in, like, this corporate job that just overworks him to death, and, like, basically, he needs a union, you know? But he's just so overworked. It's a very exploited, exploitative company, and um, a zombie outbreak starts. But he's like, that's pretty he's funny. Like the happiest person in the world, because he just doesn't have to go to work anymore. It's like all this chaos and murders and the zombies attacking are going on around him, and he's like, I'm just gonna like, it's like I have the day off. I can do all these things I never wanted to do. And he has like just this excitement because like he he's free finally, even though there's a zombie apocalypse happening. What the fuck's it called? Well, look up the name so we can you know shout out. Um, um, well, speaking of anime, this question Zom here from Mob Chef. I kept thinking Z100, okay. that's a radio station. Z100. Uh, for Mob Chef, when did you know that Vinland Saga was built different? Uh, like two episodes in, honestly. Yeah. That, did you catch up? No, I haven't seen. Uh, I downloaded season two to watch on the plane, but it was the dub, and I was like, fuck oh, this. choice. Yeah, I just couldn't do it. I tried to get through like 10 minutes of the first episode, and I was just like, it just bothers me. I think once, like, like it was obviously like the first couple episodes are really good and kind of gets you invested. But like once I kind of saw where it was going and like Thorfinn and Askeladd's dynamic and their relationship, I'm like, this is fucking, this is awesome. This is cool. And season two, um, I guess there's been some uh, back. Well, I've heard it's slower. Oh, it's much slower. So there's been a lot of back and forth that I've seen online and stuff like that. Um, but I really appreciated it. It kind of just spins the world on its head a little bit and like gives you just a different perspective on everything that's going out going down and yeah it is kind of a very different season but kind of holds true to like a lot of the themes established in the first season so i really appreciated it it's it's very very good it might be like only two seasons in um but it could be near and like and this means nothing because i've watched like five animes but definitely towards the top of my list yeah, somebody, uh, one of my friends called it a farm simulation. And I was like, oh, I could kind of yeah, get down two, with that. Yeah, it's, it's a good, good one. I, I finished, I caught up. But I like slow shit. You yeah. Know? And it's not like painfully slow. It's very interesting. Um, but it's not as action packed as the first season. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I mean, they're trying to cultivate the land, man. It's difficult. Then I caught up on. Uh, and, you know, spoiler alert, they're going to fail. Up on One Punch Man, also not the biggest fan, it was good, but yeah, I think most people just enjoy it for the laughs, for the lols. Yeah, it's funny, so I'm racking up. Uh, this question here from Allison, a top 10 anime by the end of the year, finally fill out a top 10. Yeah, you should watch uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure next. Uh, JoJo, JoJo, I was gonna do that. No, did I? St I watched one episode, it's the sexiest anime ever. What did I watch one episode of? I don't know. Uh, Allison wants to know, what do you want to see Christopher Nolan do next? What about Julius Caesar? I actually love that idea. Julius Caesar epic from old Chrissy Knoll. Roman Empire is an interesting time of history. Um, I don't know. It's like, you kind of just want him to make the next... Like, even though you said, like, and I kind of agree with you with Tenet, like, you kind of just want to see him stick into that, that world where he just keeps pushing boundaries of the stories he wants to tell it doesn't always work um i'm not gonna say it doesn't always work but maybe it's not always a masterpiece but with someone like him you just want him to keep pushing it kind of hope he strikes gold you know yeah like even with oppenheimer it's obviously not an original story but he's making it his own because he, you know insisting that the entire thing is shot in imax being three hours long it, apparently it feels more like a thriller than a biopic and that's the best way I've always said to do biopics, where it needs to be a movie first and a biopic second. 
So it's like whatever he does, he's going to put his own artistic spin on it, and it's going to be different. It's going to be unique, whether if it's a original story or not. So whatever he's cooking up in his brain, man, uh, I remember for a long time he was attached to the live-action Akira movie. I doubt that's what he's going to do next, and that movie seems like it's in development hell. <laughs> that's the thing. A lot of the movies that are in development hell right now are definitely never going to be made because of this strike. But yeah, he's a guy who's lucky enough to do his own thing, so I hope he just keeps doing that. If we had Nolan that. on for an interview, would, what question, how many questions would you get in before you asked him if he would do a superhero movie or a Star Wars movie? I would not ask any <laughs> director that. Uh, it's just so annoying. And it was interesting that he was he gave a non-answer for Star Wars. Uh, but, oh, uh, he's talked about wanting to do James Bond for a long time, and I would love that. I think that would actually be a, a great next movie for Nolan, especially to restart the franchise after Craig. I think he'd be perfect for something how many, like, like that. How, how many like movies do you think he just has banked in the back of his head right now? Oh, dude, probably dozens. I'll never... <laughs> that's it. When he's talking about uh, Tarantino wanting to retire, he's like, yeah, that's not me. Like, I, I gotta get out as many movies as I can before I call it quits. Or Scorsese, dude. Like When he talks about all the movies he wanted to do that he just never got the chance to do. Like Silence being a movie that was decades in development. I imagine even for a guy like Nolan, you feel like, oh, whatever he wants to do, he could just do it. But, you know, it takes time making those types of movies. I know we're like ant I was, it was fascinating to hear that uh, Oppenheimer was shot in 57 days. Yeah. That's wild. I know we're like anti-AI and like it kind of goes the, against the point of all the strikes going on. But like when Marty dies, like if we can just get like a brain scan... Like, I mean, we could just clone him. Yeah, but he's not gonna have the same ideas, you know. Environment affects all of that. Yeah, we have 21st century Martin Scorsese. What is he gonna be cooking? It could up? be anything, you know. It just depends on. He's got all the genius, but maybe he'll just be like a really have to bring great him up painter. in the same way he was in order to get that full potential out of him. I'm just saying, like, clone yeah, his put brain him in that and like just get all the like a wet rag and that you gotta like twist out all the water. Let's get all those ideas out. Wet rag, Martin Scorsese yeah. brain goo. And I drink it, and I become, I get all his ideas, and I become the next Scorsese. That's how it works. Uh, this question here from Ocho Ocho. How would you feel about a World War II cinematic universe? Hate it. <laughs> so sick of World War II. What do you mean? Like, just, I guess it would be, like, the same studio making different perspectives on the world, on the war but all of it interconnected. That could be kind of neat. Yeah, I guess so. Like the German movie <laughs> would be so uh, a weird, World War II. weird one to get through. I think, um, yeah, World War II is one that's like, it is fascinating. I think John Mulaney does a good bit about like, everyone's dad seems like they're, like everyone's dad is like studying for a World War II trivia contest. That's never going to come. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah. Uh, and I've definitely dads love World War II. All down that rabbit hole, like just watching all these documentaries of everything going on with it. But it is an oversaturated time period. But it, it is one of the most interesting ones. Think about all the movies that come out or have come out since then that like the villain was a Nazi or something like that. That's because like World yeah, War II no, is a real life most... story. It's like one of the greatest villains of all time. You know, The Dark Knight was good because of Joker. Even like with and, uh, some of the World War One movies, which I do like, it's a breath of fresh air because like it's just a different story, different things. It's just I don't know, it just makes it better. Like if they're they're basically going against like the German G League, you know, like the the Nazis. All of a sudden, like yeah, that's a villain, you know. What was that criticism of um, was it Dial of Destiny? Someone said that they didn't like that the uh, the bad guys were Nazis, and you know. There wasn't any other, like, they didn't give a reason why they're the villains besides that. Like, it relied <laughs> on the audience's knowledge of Nazis <laughs> for them to hate them. It's like, well, yeah. All right, one last question here. We'll end it with the oh, Tom Cruise question. Top three big Tom Cruise movies from Real quick, Matt Samson. I think it's like a revolutionary war. Like, you know, we got hype over that. Not a lot of movies. The Patriot probably being the most prominent. Well, I think a lot of filmmakers have enough self-respect that they're not going to try and attempt to make a movie better than The Patriot. That's I mean, true. they saw Mel Gibson carrying that flag in the middle of the battle. They're like, this is it. This is the war movie. 
Uh, I, I, it's also funny because that war was like really not supported by anybody but the rich people. All the poor people were like, "What? What's Great Britain? I don't know what that is." They're like, "What's a gun?" Don't worry, we need this war. If you want baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie, like, okay. Yeah, they didn't know. They didn't know what they were fighting for, but yeah, if they knew we're that, reaping those benefits. They knew that this would result in Babe Ruth. I think they would have been all all on board. <laughs> Uh, this question here from Matt underscore Samson one top three Tom Cruise movies. Sheesh. Uh, let's see. What are the three best Mission Impossibles? <laughs> Disrespectful to uh, Tropic Thunder. Risky business. <laughs> uh, in terms of my favorite, it would be Rogue Nation, Collateral, and uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Hmm. That's that's been going like audible mention to the last samurai. <laughs> that's been going like kind of viral eyes wide shut lately. Um, yeah, it has. What was the movie that when he was the plane and he was smuggling stuff? American Made. Oh, uh, American Made. Not in the top three, but I just thought of that movie. Um, good movie. I mean, a few good men. I'm a sucker for courthouse dramas. Um, his, his filmography is really yeah, fucking stacked. Barry McGuire, Born on the Fourth of July. My eyes wide shut, risky business, the top guns. I mean Top Gun Maverick, you know, it's up there, I feel like. I almost put that up there. Oh, he's been, he's really been at it for so long. Yeah, I think Fallout maybe I'll give I mean Tropic Thunder. I can as a comedy maybe. And a few good men, I'm confident with that pick. Need to get a binding resolution from the United Nations to stop me from fucking you up. <laughs> That movie is so funny, dude. Collateral to me is his best because he's just, he didn't play a, a villain enough throughout his career, but my goodness, is he terrifying in that fucking movie. He is, it's a little scary, but he is really good at playing a sociopath. Well, I mean, there's a, yeah, yeah. There's some arguments there. No, there's an argument to be made. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're missing a big one. Look at the old IMDb. 61 years old. You see that? Someone complaining that age gap between him and Haley Atwell. Oh my god, yeah, it's so stupid. 41. And also, like, they weren't in any type of romantic relationship in that movie. No, he literally never bangs any of his co-stars. Except the one he banged off screen. And he's way more in love with Ving Rhames than he is any of the other characters. Oh, Magnolia. But, uh, Magnolia? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's a movie I never watch. That's one that a lot of people would put up there. It's every time I see it, and I see the three hours, I'm like, yeah. This is a, a well, mini series. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a yeah. You got to chop it up. Noah Skies. That's one people like. Like I said with Scorsese, if we can like somehow like get some robot technology, like I, I kind of just want Tom Cruise to just make movies forever. Maybe like um like a Futurama thing where they just put his head in like a little water thing, keep him alive. Something. Like you can get creative with that. Imagine if this man had like an AI body or like a robot body, like Robocop. Just think of the Mission Impossibles we would have. Yeah, you know what? I think that maybe not when it comes to Tom Cruise. I don't know what type of power we'd want to give that type of man. I mean at this point. Well, let me stop you there before the powers that be getting it, get any ideas. That does it for today's episode of the Nerd Sue Podcast. We're going to stop it here before I die because my nose is so running right now. It's actually killing me. But you know what? I enjoyed this recording. Had a lot to yell and scream about and some positive things to talk about, too. And uh, our next podcast is going to be Barbenheimer. So looking forward to that. Yeah. Hey. Aaron, as always, thanks for joining me. Yeah, just... uh drink plenty of fluids get your vitamin c up can't be sick i know dude i feel so bad for the people who may be sitting next to me but me well yeah not so much you because you know what you're getting into but the the stranger i have way more sympathy for strangers than friends yeah that's actually pretty like i think nice of you (laughs) all right guys we'll be back hopefully you guys are all watching barbie and oppenheimer over the weekend because that's what we'll be doing and we'll be back to talk about it see you soon bye wow that was probably our best review yet hey guys aaron the nerd suit monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video 
Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make nerd soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.